I'm really excited to introduce our speaker today, Patricia Silveria. Let she tell me if I said it remotely accurately. <laughs> um, my accent's not the best, uh, but I'll, I, I do my best. Uh, and her, the title of the talk is Asthma and Women, Lessons Learned from Clinical and Animal Studies. I've heard her speak before. We're really in for a treat. She does a great job. Uh, but first, I want to acknowledge that uh, we live, work, and play at the cluster, um, many of us at least, in a community on the unceded, ceded, and traditional territories of the 203 First Nations, along with 38 Métis chartered communities, each of us which possess their own unique traditions and history on this land that uh, many of us now live in, which is uh, British Columbia. But I recognize that many of us are joining from other areas, and I encourage you to learn about the Indigenous peoples on lands of which you dwell. Uh, we acknowledge the importance of the Truth and Reconciliation Committee of Canada's call to action, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and the BC Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act. In all of our work, we're committed to ensuring Indigenous women's rights to health and safety and equal opportunity to participate in a manner that recognizes and respects Indigenous cultures and traditions. And I'll just say, I've been learning a lot about uh, Indigenous cultures and um, they have a lot to teach us. It's really quite amazing. Um, so today I'm joining you from Vancouver, which is part of the unceded homelands of the Coast Salish peoples, the traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh -Well First Nations. So thank you for joining us. Um, this is a women's uh, health cluster initiative. So it's a uh, women's health, uh, health seminar series. Uh, if you're not a member, please do become a member. We have over 420 members, um, including uh, faculty, trainees, and across and community members across 18 different countries. We have a number of different events and outreaches. Right now, there's a uh, conference going on about hormonal contraceptives and how they affect the brain. Um, we have a number of how-to uh, SGBA, for those of you that don't know what that is, that's sex and gender-based analysis, which is um, Canadian Institute for Health and Research. Uh, so sort of equivalent to your NIH in the U.S. We also have a, a brilliant podcast and a blog that was just rated number seven worldwide. So uh, please do check it out. Uh, and uh, please do submit an idea to write a blog if you're interested. A lot of trainees uh, tend to do that. We have a lot of trainee awards. So please um, do look out for those announcements and apply to them. Our success rate is very, very good. I would say the high 90s to uh, three digits. So please do uh, apply. And uh, we really acknowledge all the work from our uh, and money from our sponsors. And if you'd like to become a member, please do so. Uh, now I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that Dr. Silveria, is that how you say it? Probably not. Almost, yeah. <laughs> Almost getting there. Silveria, I don't know. Silveria. <laughs> Silveria. Silveria. Something Silveria. like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, gotta roll that, roll that uh, tongue there. Um, uh, and she'll uh, start sharing her slides while I read out her bio and her fun fact. Um, uh, Dr. Sylvia is an associate professor of environmental and occupational health at Indiana University, Bloomington School of Public Health. Uh, she's also, I think, maybe acting head at the moment or chair at the moment as well. Um, and her laboratory studies sex-specific mechanisms of lung inflammation and asthma, and in response to air, air pollution exposures. She received her PhD from, um, uh, oh, sorry, I lost my, lost in biochemistry from the University of Buenos Aires in Argentina, and then came to the US as a postdoctoral fellow. In 2013, she established her own independent research program at Penn State University, and then later joined UNC Chapel Hill as an associate professor and served as the, as the director of the Biobehavioral Lab. Since uh, 2021, she leads uh, an R01-funded lab at Indiana University where she studies sex and gender differences in asthma and where she serves as chair of the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health. In her free time, she enjoys running, come back to that in just a second, practicing yoga and spending time with her two dogs and cat. I'd like to know how well they get along. But her fun fact is she's run five marathons, not one, not two, five. I can barely like, I don't know, that's amazing. So kudos to you. Uh, and thank you so much for agreeing to do this. Over thank you so much, Lisa. Thank you so much, everybody who's here and uh, for inviting me to share my work with you today. As my title says, uh, I'm going to talk to you about asthma in women and what we have learned from clinical and animal studies. The good thing about addressing you is that you probably already know the difference between sex and gender. <laughs> 
a lot of times I give this talk to clinicians or to people who are not familiar with sex and gender variables. And I have to explain the difference and why we care and how they differentially affect health. Uh, as you know, sex refers to biological aspects that can influence health, whether it is uh, genes in our chromosomes, whether it is uh, hormones produced by our reproductive organs, um, and uh, any other uh, factors that make males and females different. However, when we talk about gender, it's not necessarily a biological aspect. It's not a biological aspect. It's a um, socially constructed um, variable and is defined by cultures and it may mean different things in different contexts, but they can affect um, the they can affect our health and how disease presents, because especially in my field, occupations may affect how one is exposed to certain contaminants or certain pollutants that may affect your lungs. Um, it could also um, affect how people take medicine, how people access health, and therefore affect the incidence and the prevalence of certain diseases. So today I will be talking to you about lung health and lung disease in particular, one particular lung disease, which is asthma. But just to um, give an example of what I just said in the prior uh, slide, uh, sex and gender can affect lung health in different ways. Uh, for example, uh, this is a typical example of a sex difference in lung disease uh, at a given level of a smoke, cigarette smoke exposure. What we observe is that women have higher rates of uh, COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, than men. And this has to do with uh, mechanisms of uh, the, um, how we process toxicants that are present in cigarette smoke and how sex hormones have been shown to affect the activity of certain enzymes that help us get rid of these toxins. So that's a very well-known sex difference. Um, in terms of gender, there are certain gender roles, as I said, that may either influence occupations or um, cultural expectations that may put men and women at different uh, risk to be exposed to certain pollutants. For example, we know that women, in, especially in countries, um, in certain countries that are in inter-world nations, uh, they are exposed to indoor air pollution by cooking and cooking indoors. And that is happens more in women because women typically have that role. So when we look at the epidemiology of COPD in those nations, we see that women have higher levels of COPD. Uh, so what we really observe is an intersection between sex and gender for COPD, uh, but it's important to discriminate what is the effect of a higher exposure to a certain pollutant or a cigarette smoke, for example. Men tend to smoke more than women in certain countries, but what is the other effect? What is the effect of the biological aspect? What are the mechanisms that occur differentially in the lungs of the males and the females? And that is a lot of what I do in my laboratory. I study the biology, I study the sex, but I am in a department of environmental and occupational health where most of my colleagues study effects that are mostly influenced by gender. So we collaborate a lot. Um, the last example I have is about gender bias. And this also influenced the incidence and the prevalence of diseases of the lung. This is a study that was published uh, several years ago in which they took a group of physicians, 192 physicians from the US and Canada, and they gave them the same clinical information, but they changed the patient's name to a male or female name, typical name. And what happened was that given the same clinical information, uh, physicians were more likely to diagnose men with COPD and women with asthma. Uh, and actually the numbers are there, they were significant. Uh, and this had to do with the fact that traditionally due to the high incidence of smoking in men in most nations and that women weren't allowed to smoke, uh, rates of COPD tended to be higher in men. However, that resulted in physicians not acknowledging COPD symptoms in women when women started presenting uh, these symptoms due to either higher exposure to certain pollutants or smoking. 
So both sex and gender and gender in, in the sense of gender bias can affect how we see the prevalence of diseases of the lung and obviously other diseases. This is a, a slide that you probably have observed, but I brought it back because in lung disease research, this is also very prevalent. Uh, when we look at cell-based research, what we observe is that um, a lot of experiments are done with cells where the sex is not specified of, or if we look at the cell types and we go uh, in ATCC and we look what kind of cells were used. A lot of times there's more cells that um, come from male patients than from female patients. It's very hard to find female patient cells, cell lines particularly, to do studies in lung disease. Um, most of them come from lung cancers and most of them come from males. So that makes very difficult some of the studies that I do with hormones uh, because I am putting female hormones in male cells. And we know, you and I know, that this is probably going to uh, add more noise than help us decipher a mechanism. Similarly, when we look at the studies that were done in animal uh, in animals to study either asthma or any other lung diseases, for the most part, we see that they use males or they mix males and females and they just don't separate the sexes. And this has changed after the NIH started requiring this, but it's still an issue in certain laboratories. Um, and obviously in clinical studies, uh, we tended to have more recruitment of men than women uh, for historical reasons or for um, the tradition of protecting women or the reluctance of women to participate in these studies, but that has started to change. So as you know, not having these, um, not incorporating the female sex variable in all this preclinical work and clinical work has resulted in uh, females having higher incidence of uh, negative effects associated with the uh, treatments and the drugs that are available to treat certain diseases and um, a very, very high uh, number of incidents that are uh, severe or even causing death occur in women as this paper that you probably read many times clearly shows. There are many lung diseases that displace sex differences and not necessarily at the adult level. So I'll just walk you through some of the ones that we know and have been described. Even when we're born, neonatal lung disease, being born premature, being a boy is very different than being born premature, being a girl. And that is because in the uh, process of lung development at one of the very late stages, the female lung starts producing surfactant earlier than the male lung in a difference of about two weeks. So what happens is that if a boy is born prematurely at the same age, gestational age than a girl, um, the girl is gonna have enough surfactant to breed, whereas the boy is going to have collapsed lung or uh, develop a disease called respiratory distress syndrome. And that is a difference of two weeks only sometimes. Um, and that is a deficiency in surfactant due to the fact that the biology of the surfactant production is different in the male than the female lung while it's being developed. When this occurs in babies, when they're born prematurely and they require help breeding, either by providing exogenous surfactant or by um, having to be put on a ventilator, Receiving this mechanical ventilation requires that they are exposed to high levels of oxygen, more than the 21% that is in the environment. These babies sometimes have 40, 50, 60% of oxygen. These high levels of oxygen, while they are good to help the baby breathe, they can cause oxidative stress that will damage the cells and will impair the proper development of the lung. So when we see a baby at the gestational age of 36 weeks, which is when the, the lung should be fully term and uh, fully developed, what we see is that this lung is not properly developed and there is what is called a dysplasia. So this is what it's, uh, this name is. It's bronchopulmonary dysplasia and it's a disease that occurs mostly as a result of this mechanical ventilation. And we also observe more incidence of VPD in boys than in girls. So whether it is a surfactant production in the development or whether it is 
the response to this exogenous oxygen, boys seem to have a disadvantage and it's called the male disadvantage. As we grow up, boys and girls start showing differences in how they respond to certain uh, environmental exposures. Uh, what we see is that in response to smoking exposure, uh, boys tend to have more allergic responses or asthma-like wheezing responses. We also see that the incidence of asthma tends to be higher in boys than girls. But after puberty, this um, flips. So what we see is more women with asthma than men. And I'll be talking about that a lot in the next set of slides. I mentioned earlier that COPD started to be recognized more and more in women than men. COPD is a disease that usually presents in the mid to late 40s and later in life. But what we see overall in incidence is that now there are more women uh, with COPD than men. And before it used to be a disease that even physicians will just confuse and diagnose only men. In other diseases also associated with smoking, such as lung cancer, we see that um, there's different rates depending on the type of cancer, but we see more adenocarcinoma in women than men. And we see more lung cancer in men that smoke, but more lung cancer in women that do not smoke. So they get more lung cancer when there are no smokers, and this happens earlier in life than the men that smoke and get lung cancer. So it seems like the mechanisms involved in this uh, tumor development are probably very different between male and females. Other diseases of the lung um, are pulmonary hypertension. This is a disease that is very complex and it has been associated uh, with um, both a sex and a gender effect in women. It's more prevalent in women. Um, there are some mechanisms that are that are female specific that involve estradiol, but there's also association with the use of certain drugs to, uh, that women use to lose weight. Uh, some amphetamines have been uh, associated with incidence of pulmonary hypertension, so we believe it's a combination of sex and gender. The idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is seen much more in men than in women. Cystic fibrosis, depending on the age, in general, the, the rates are similar, tending to more women than men, but the infections that make cystic fibrosis worse uh, happen more in women than in men. Uh, similarly, there's a disease that almost exclusively happens in women, it's called LAM. And the very recent lung disease that we all learn about, COVID-19, um, when we look at the rate at which the virus infects the lungs, is very similar for males and females. However, when we look at the disease itself, the, the manifestation of COVID-19 and how serious it becomes in terms of being hospitalized, being admitted to the ICU, being intubated or dying, this happens more frequently in men than women and older men than older women. However, if we get COVID and we recover, and we get, we get what is called the post-acute sequelae of COVID or PASC. It has been shown in recent studies, because this is a very recent disease, that it happens about five to 10% more in women than men. So clearly we have more work to do, but the lungs of the males and the females uh, function very differently, respond very differently to environmental exposures and uh, probably have different mechanisms by which they develop or fight disease. And that is what I do in my lab. For the most part, I try to understand how asthma is different between males and females and how the environment makes this asthma worse. I mentioned earlier that um, if we look throughout the age, we see that the prevalence of asthma is higher in boys before puberty than in girls. And then after puberty, this uh, crosses, and now we have more adult women than men uh, with asthma. I went on the CDC data, which unfortunately does not separate the data by puberty. They separate it by 18 years or older or 18 years or younger. So this is what I plotted here, taking the data from the CDC between 2016 and 2020. So if you look here, you see that these are boys and these are girls. So boys more than girls, right? 
in 2016, in 2017, in 2018, in 2019, and in 2020, it seems like the voice rate of asthma, the prevalence, the percent in the population, significantly dropped to the point that is almost similar to the one of girls. And this is consistent to a prior hypothesis that said that most of these sex differences observed prior to puberty uh, were probably related to how the lung responds to the environment. And what happened in 2020 is that a lot of people went indoors. Uh, so the, and a lot of people started wearing masks. So what happens probably is that the uh, reduction in these exposures to environmental factors, whether it is allergens or pollutants, um, is probably causing this drop. We are yet to see what happens when we see the data from 2021 and 2022. If this holds true, if this goes back, then we can uh, determine what's going on before puberty. I spend most of my time studying what happens after puberty, and that hasn't changed with the pandemic. If you look at the incidence, of, sorry, the prevalence of asthma in men is about six to five percent consistently, whether there's pandemic or not. But in women, it's almost twice as much, and that continued to happen uh, even during the pandemic. So we believe that this post-puberty difference between uh, males and females in the asthma prevalence is uh, associated with uh, effects due to gonadal hormones. And that is most of the work that I'm going to show you. So first of all, I want to show you that it hasn't been studied quite <laughs> in depth in the past uh, 30 years. If you do a PubMed search of asthma alone or asthma and sex or gender, because sex and gender sometimes are interchanged uh, in publications, not everybody knows the difference. So I add both terms when I do the search. Uh, what you see is that between 1993 and 2002, very, very few papers. It's growing, but it's a very, very small proportion of papers that have keywords that include sex or gender uh, in asthma. So we know very little, and I kind of already told you that. <laughs> but also, if we look at uh, what happens in women who have asthma, what are the type of things that they present more than men? So let's say we have both men and women that have asthma. What we see is that uh, women tend to have less visits in the doctor where they do spirometry. This is a study that is done to actually do the proper diagnosis of asthma. So they are less likely to be sent to do this type of study. They're much more likely to be hospitalized or be uh, admitted in the emergency department. So these women with asthma, they end up in the ED. So they don't properly manage it before or they have higher rate of exacerbations that require going to the emergency department. Uh, they also have more uh, asthma specific physician office visits. They have less uh, asthma specific specialist visits. They, less, they have less asthma controller prescriptions and they have more asthma reliever prescriptions. So it seems to be a, a different way uh, in, in the way that they're treated, like less prevention. And these causes that asthma appears more severe in women. We also see that um, we also tend to believe that hormones are related with asthma because of what we see during pregnancy. There's a number of women that when they have asthma and get pregnant, nothing happens. There's the other third that they, it makes it worse, and there's the other third that it makes it better. So we, we call this the 30% rule in asthma <laughs> in women. And it's probably because what we call asthma is a combination of symptoms and it's a combination of phenotypes. So it is very likely that these 30% of women are actually having different types of asthma and what happens when the hormonal uh, changes that occur during pregnancy are affecting these mechanisms differently. And also we have to take into account that this only mentions pregnancy. It doesn't even mention in which trimester. So some women may just say that they had more asthma, but it may have just happened during the third trimester or the second trimester where the levels of hormones are different. We also have about 40% of women with asthma who report having what is called premenstrual or perimenstrual asthma. 
what happens is that um, in the last week of the menstrual cycle, where both estrogen and progesterone are high, women uh, have increased asthma symptoms. This is a condition that has been described uh, many years ago, actually in the 20s. And it was actually a psychology paper that was uh, mentioning um, premenstrual syndrome. And these increased asthma symptoms were part of the premenstrual syndrome. So clearly there's something going on um, between the menstrual cycle and asthma symptoms, but we haven't figured out what and how. This study looked at different ways in which we diagnose asthma. For example, using your uh, rescue inhaler more than three times. Um, what they did in this study is they just took women with asthma and they separated if it happened during the last week or not. So they call it premenstrual asthma or non-premenstrual asthma. And what they saw is that they used more times um, their um, rescue inhaler. They were more likely to visit the emergency department. They were more likely to be hospitalized, admitted to the ICU and being intubated. So clearly something's going on when these hormones are high, but what is happening is still not clear. There's also studies that have looked at what happens when uh, women with asthma, women without asthma take oral contraceptives. What happens to their asthma symptoms? There's been so many studies, but they all use different methods, different size samples, different populations, different types of oral contraceptives. I'm sure a lot of people in the audience deal with this in their own research. Uh, so the systematic review that was published in 2018 took all these studies and they analyzed them. And what they found is that there was always an increased risk of asthma when there was an early onset of the menarche. So meaning that perhaps when the lung is exposed to sex hormones at an earlier age or for a longer period of time, uh, this has a pro-inflammatory phenotype that may be associated with a later development of asthma. So you see here that the effect measure is higher um, when there's an early onset of menarche. Also irregularities in menstruation, in menstrual cycle, were also associated with an increased risk of asthma. They also look at the type of uh, contraceptive that was used and um, for how long. And what they found is that whether they use it ever past or current, using estrogen only hormone replacement therapy was associated with an increased risk of asthma. You can see that here in all the analysis, the meta-analysis that they do for all the studies. Uh, and it didn't matter how we diagnosed this asthma, if it was just an onset, if it was having asthma, making it worse, if it was just wheezing, or if it was an allergic rhinitis, that is a very similar mechanism that asthma. However, uh, this Systematic review also concluded that there were very few of these studies conducted in a way that was considered high quality. So it was very difficult to assess if this was just causality or if it was just association. So obviously more studies are needed that control for these doses and these types of uh, hormones that are being used uh, to be able to say that um, replacement therapy is good or bad for asthma or has an effect or not. But everything tends to tell us that perhaps estrogen uh, could be influencing asthma in a negative way. There's another study that wasn't published yet. I actually, uh, he's a collaborator of mine, Dr. Sang, and uh, he published this in uh, an abstract. He presented this at uh, American Thoracic Society a few years ago. He went into clinical records and took about 2.5 million patients. And in there, he found about 5% incidence of asthma. And then he took of all those clinical records, how many were transitions, male to female or female to male, where they were just by hormones or by uh, gender affirming surgery. And what he found is that um, the prevalence of asthma in these individuals that were transitioning uh, gender was much higher than in the general population. That was finding number one. The second finding was that the odds ratio of having asthma compared to the total population was 3.4 and 3.7 
uh, uh, odds ratio higher. Uh, when the transition was male to female, where if it was just by hormones or by uh, surgery. And when the transition was from female to male, it was also higher, but it was only 2.62 and 2.65. So transitioning one way or another is associated with an increase in asthma prevalence, but transitioning from male to female is higher. There's a few explanations for this, potential explanations for this. One is the, the hypothesis that the male that the female hormones are more pro-inflammatory in the lung and the male hormones are believed to be anti-inflammatory. But there's the whole um, association of potential stress uh, with what happens in the lung. So the, the effect of the stress and stress hormones and cortisol um, hasn't been studied in much depth in the lung and is probably contributing uh, to this increase in asthma. Uh, that we observe in these individuals. Obviously, Dr. Sain has to continue doing this work and uh, hopefully I'll be collaborating with him in this study, but this is just an abstract that was published. So there's possible factors that I mentioned in lung development, in lung anatomy, in the biology of the airway smooth muscle, which contributes to the contraction and, and the narrowing of the airway. There's differences potentially in immunology but also in the environmental exposures. I told you about the exposure to cooking and tobacco, but we actually, in a book that I published a few years ago, uh, there was a chapter that I did in collaboration with Dr. Rebulli from UNC Chapel Hill, where we look at every paper that has been published and how the relationship between exposure to different air pollutants uh, uh, was, was related to to mortality or hospitalization or exacerbation of lung disease. And for the most part, we found that women tend to be more susceptible to the effects of um, the environment and these pollutants. And a lot of it was in asthma. There's also the potential contribution of genetics, the uh, genes in the X chromosome or the Y chromosome contributing to these differences or a combination of those with uh, the sex hormones that I've been talking to you about. So in the laboratory, we have many ways to study asthma and we have many ways to trigger asthma. We can put uh, mice to certain pollutants. For example, we can put cigarette smoke or we can put uh, ozone or we can put air particulate matter and that can develop uh, a model that will resemble some of the features of asthma. We can also give them an allergen challenge. We can put house as mites, so we can put alternaria, we can put certain mixes of fungi and bacteria that would trigger the lung to have an immunological response and that will cause an asthma phenotype. And then we have chambers in which we can measure pressures and volumes that will tell us whether the lung is being contracted or expanded at different rates. So whether there is some uh, hyper responsiveness of the lung we can challenge the mice with certain drugs that will tell us if the animals are having more airway resistance, more wheezing, and features that we observe in humans. And this apparatus is called a flexivent. It's a ventilator for mice. So we can intubate mice and we can see the differences in pressures and volumes and the resistance in the lung when we challenge them with um, uh, bronchoconstrictors or with uh, an allergen. So we have all of that in the lab. Um, and we do use more than one model to study asthma. So this is one model that um, we published a few years ago. This is Noe. He was a summer student in my lab. He's a physician now. He did all his summer internship, got into medical school and graduated. He put male and female mice and exposed them to this protocol that has uh, ozone at two parts per million for three hours. This is a very high concentration of ozone and that triggers an asthma-like phenotype. It's more like an um, airway hyper-responsiveness. He took the lungs, look at gene expression at a very short time. And then he also looked at the responsiveness in the lung using this apparatus that I showed you earlier. And what we found, he found is that the, the, the genes that were expressed in the lung after this exposure to ozone were very different in the males and the females. The females tend to have more immune um, response related genes and higher expression of them, which is uh, represented here by green, <laughs> um, than the males. And when we look at the type of um, pathways that these genes were associated with, we found that in the females, there was more communication between innate and adaptive immune cells, which is a feature of asthma. He also looked at individual genes 
And he found that a lot of genes were increased when this exposed to ozone, but he found that the expression, relative expression levels were higher in the females exposed to ozone than the males exposed to ozone. And this was true with a lot of macrophage inflammatory proteins and interleukin-6, which is a very pro-inflammatory uh, gene. He also looked at the differences in the airway hyperresponsiveness in the response to a bronchoconstrictor called metacoline. What we see here is a measure called PNH, that when it is higher, it means that there's more uh, restriction in the lung, it's, there's, there's um, hyperresponsiveness. So what he observed is that the female mice and the same uh, challenge with metacoline were having a higher hyperresponsiveness than the male mice after they were exposed to ozone. So meaning that the asthma phenotype was different in one sex than another. So from there, we determined that there were sex differences. So now we wanted to see if hormones were contributing to these sex differences. And we used two models for this. The first model was just to use the murine estrus cycle. If you ever work with mice and you study hormones, you know that in four to five days, the mice rep replicates what happens in a woman in a month. And what we see is a peak of estrogen and a peak of progesterone that correlate with uh, proestrus and estrus and metestrus and diestrus. So we can actually group these phases and some people call them the follicular phase and the luteal phase. So we took animals in these phases uh, where we expect to have more estrogen in the first phase, the follicular phase, or where we expect to have more progesterone in the luteal phase. And we did the exact same experiment. Now we took these animals, we look at the vaginal smear, we look at their hormones and we determine in which phase of the cycle they were. And then we put them to the same ozone chamber at the same time of the day, because we know that the hormonal changes in, uh, anim in rodents are dependent on the time and they're circadian. So all the animals were exposed at the same time of the day. And then we harvest uh, mice at two different time points, one to look at the gene expression and one to look at the inflammation scores and the airway hyperresponsiveness. This was in collaboration with a graduate student in my lab, Natalie Fuentes, which some of you have met. So what we observe here is that when the animals were exposed to ozone in the luteal phase versus the follicular phase, uh, different genes were expressed. And most of the genes that were differentially expressed between males and females were highly expressed in the follicular phase rather than in the luteal phase. When we look at the types of pathways by which these genes were associated with, we found more cellular function and maintenance in the luteal phase where the progesterone was high and more immune cell trafficking in the follicular phase with the estrogen is high. And this made us, uh, this correlated with the phenotype that we observed of how many cells were infiltrated to the lung after exposure, exposure to ozone. We saw that there were more total cells when the estrogen was high and there were more neutrophils, significantly higher neutrophils in the follicular phase when the estrogen was high versus when the progesterone was high. So this point has to believe that estrogen is associated with the hyperresponsiveness and the inflammatory response. So we look at the gene expression and we compare between the luteal and the follicular phase. And we saw that almost every pro-inflammatory gene that we measure was higher in the follicular phase. Uh, we took this from the array and we validated them. And then we also saw more hyper-responsiveness in the animals exposed in the follicular phase, meaning that estrogen is probably uh, involved in this differential phenotype between males and females. So now we wanted to know if estrogen was involved. And we knew that estrogen receptors were expressed in multiple immune cells in the lung, but we, nobody had ever done that experiment. So we did a typical experiment of doing a gonadectomy and then replacing uh, with uh, estradiol. We gave an oral administration of estradiol uh, for 14 days, two weeks. And after that, um, our control received vehicle, which was just um, sesame oil. And after that, we did the same experiment. We put them to the ozone or the filter air as a control. So Natalie did this and she tricked the mice to eat the estradiol at the dose she wanted daily. Every day she went there and she put the estradiol mixed with a little bit of Nutella and the mice loved the Nutella. So they got their daily dose of estradiol or their 
vehicle uh, just in a few seconds, as you can see here in this video that she recorded. So when we look at uh, the animals, uh, estradiol levels in the blood, we saw that they were very similar to the sham animals. So the animals that were just sham operated had uh, levels similar to what we see in a proestrus. And this is what uh, we observe in the animals that receive the Nutella. And as you can see here, the animals that were just gonadectomized had very low levels. So then we look at what happened in the lungs of these animals after being exposed to ozone. And interestingly, what we observe is that when we're gonna dectomize the mice and expose them to ozone, we had less number of cells infiltrated to the lungs and less number of neutrophils infiltrated to the lungs. And when the animals were gonna dectomize and replace with estradiol, we restored the phenotype of the sham animal. We also were able to reduce the airway hyperresponsiveness in the animals uh, gonadectomized and restored it with estradiol to the levels of the control uh, when we did this experiment um, after the animals were exposed to ozone. And then we look at gene expression of these same genes that I told you earlier that were different between the males and females and that were different between the follicular and the luteal phase and the same pattern was observed. We had the high levels in the sham, the ovariectomy, reduce these levels, and then we restore the phenotype with the estradiol treatment, with just two weeks of estradiol uh, orally, both in macrophage inflammatory protein three and interleukin six, which were the genes that were the higher expressed and the, the ones with the higher differences between males and females. So um, by now you probably believe me that <laughs> in the context of ozone, uh, estradiol makes the lung um, responding with a pro-inflammatory phenotype. However, asthma occurs in response to multiple exposures. Uh, so one of the types of asthma responses that we were interested in was allergic asthma. And there had been some work done in the past in which multiple cell types, uh, meaning, you know, um, specifically eosinophils, neutrophils, and certain types of T cells, Th2 cells, which are pro-inflammatory, uh, they have been um, shown to be altered by, ex by uh, exogenous hormones. For the most part, both estrogen and progesterone have been associated with increased hyperresponsiveness and with type 2 inflammation, meaning eosinophils, ILC2s, and then uh, interleukin-13 and interleukin-5 that are produced by T cells. Also more allergic inflammation and more non-type 2 inflammation as well with mediated by interleukin-17 and neutrophils. On the other hand, testosterone had been shown uh, to be um, inhibitory of these phenotypes. So testosterone is believed to be uh, anti-asthma <laughs> or anti-inflammatory. So why would I tell you this? Because we also gonna dectomize males and we treated them with estradiol. We wanted to see if the effect of estradiol was different in the context of the male or the female cell. We found some interesting results when we did this. When we gonna dectomize the males, we saw less total number of cells in the lung, but we actually saw more neutrophils in the lung. So it seems like testosterone is inhibiting um, the um, infiltration of neutrophils to the lung, uh, but estradiol uh, actually restored that phenotype back. So estradiol somehow was having an anti-inflammatory effect in the male lung, which we still cannot explain. And moving on to a model that you are familiar with, uh, we recently started looking at the four core genotypes and how they can help us understand these interactions between uh, sex hormones and sex chromosomes, because I just showed you that the same hormone <laughs> does a different effect in the males and the females. So if you're not familiar with the four core genotypes, um, there is a mutation that um, causes that the Y chromosome does not have the SRY region, therefore they will not develop uh, testicles, they will not produce testosterone, but then this is moved to the chromosome 3, so you can create animals that are XX and have ovaries, or XX that have testes, and the other way around, XY that have ovaries, or XY that have testes. So we actually changed the model here, we use an allergic model using a combination of two allergens, 
um, that are dust mites that are found in your carpet, probably. <laughs> this is called the American house dust mite, the Dermatophagoides farina, and the other one is called the European house dust mite. Uh, we're not just studying asthma in Europe and America. I'll show you in the next slide that these are way more prevalent than just America and Europe. They just have that name. But we gave this to the animals for five weeks intranasally. And after five weeks, what we observe is uh, very similar to asthma phenotype. So we look at gene expression, we look at lung function, and we look at the infiltration of cells to the lung and the histology. This is the distribution of all these allergens throughout the world. It's not just America and Europe, and you can actually check this paper out. But going back to our uh, study, uh, we really wanted to see if having uh, the X chromosome, the Y chromosome, or the male or the female gonad had an influence on how this phenotype presented. And this is work by uh, Dami, who is a postdoc in my lab currently. What Dami found very recently, this is a very, very preliminary data, is that with regards to the airway hyperresponsiveness, the animals that have the female gonad, whether they are XX or XY, tend to have a higher response compared to the control. But the animals that have the male gonad don't seem to have much difference. In all cases, treating them with the allergen caused an increase in hyperresponsiveness, but it seems like the female gonad is helping this being more exacerbated. Obviously, the N is still um, not there to do a statistical analysis, but these are the trends that we're observing. Dami also looked at the neutrophils infiltrated to the lung, and she also found that all the animals that had female gonad, regardless of the X or Y chromosome, had higher neutrophilic inflammation. And then she looked at gene expression, and she found common trends in genes that are differentially expressed by RNA-seq, Animals with the female gonad had more pro-inflammatory genes and genes related to respiratory disease, whereas animals with the male gonad had more um, cells related to immune cell trafficking or cellular development, but not necessarily inflammation, disease, or injury. So she is looking into these genes more individually to see how is it that just the hormone or the combination of hormone and chromosome can influence that. But everything seems to point out uh, to a stronger effect of the female hormones uh, than the chromosomes in our model. So that's all I have for you. I'm going to summarize briefly what I told you um, in my talk. I talked to you about sex differences that present in multiple lung diseases. Uh, also, my model with ozone showed that lung inflammatory responses and airway hyperresponsiveness uh, differs in the estrous cycle and seems to be exacerbated by estradiol. Um, but estradiol appears to have different effects in the male and female cells. Um, the male gonadal hormones appear to have suppressive effect. We saw that in the male's gonadectomies, the higher infiltration of um, immune cells and also higher gene expression that I didn't show you. And in re regards to how cells might induce asthma, we see that sex differences are more likely to be influenced by ovarian hormones than the chromosomal effects. So with that, I'm gonna thank my team, everybody who's contributed to this work in my prior and my current institution, all the funding that we have received from NIH since I started my lab several years ago. And I also wanted to let you know that my department is hiring faculty. So if you're interested, please contact me. Uh, we would love to have you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Oh, there yeah. it is. Uh, for some reason, my stupid uh, computer. Yeah, you are muted again. I cannot hear you. Ah, for some Sorry. reason, my computer wasn't letting me unmute. Now I think it's fine. Uh, uh, I clicked the wrong button. That's what happened. Um, thank you so much for that brilliant talk. Uh, really, even though it's not my area of expertise, I really always learn a lot whenever I hear you speak. Uh, it's really, they're very, it's very clear. So I really... Um, appreciate it. And uh, I know it's really difficult to have these um, kinds of talks. So if those of you online, if you can, please do like a little emoji or unmute yourself and clap or something. I saw the clapping. Yeah. Oh, good, good, good. good. The, world yeah, yeah, yeah. The, claps are, <laughs> the claps are really appreciated. Um,
And if you have any questions, you can put it in the chat or you can just unmute yourself and ask your question. Um, we have a few uh, minutes for questions. Uh, and I have some myself, but uh, please don't be shy. And um, I'm taking myself, I was in the big view, so I was just taking myself off that big view. Um, <laughs> Uh, and so please do, I should really um, stand back and let you guys ask a question, but I'll, I'll try to um, break the ice and ask some questions first. The 30% um, the thing really intrigues me, the 30, 30, 30 rule. So you mentioned trimester. So is, and nobody's, nobody's like looked a little deeper to see what that might be. Like maybe it's, maybe also fetal sex might play a role. Like um, and that's why, like, you know, if people like sort of do these, uh, make, you know, consider these other factors that might be playing a role, it might, it might be better than 30, 30, 30. Do you know what I mean? Yes. I, I think I saw a poster once. That's oh yeah. Look at the, yeah, the fetal <laughs> sex influencing, um, asthma, but it, yeah, it was very small study. Right. I don't even remember. I know that there was a difference, but yeah. I don't even remember to, you know, if it was male to female, female to male. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't know, I, but I know that there was one posted. Find something, yeah. Oh, yeah. I really hope people follow up on that. Um, and then obviously with the trimester, of course, you get like different kinds of inflammatory profiles. I think it kind of flips from anti-inflammatory to pro-inflammatory. So that I think that's a really important to like consider, like what what might be going on. It's so. I guess it's frustrating to me that um, we, you know, it's 2022 and we still don't have some of these sort of base, basic answers to, to how, because it, it seems complicated, right? Estrogens and progesterone um, and their influence on some of these. Um, yeah, there are some animal studies, not with pregnancy, but just yeah, in general course, that, yeah, yeah. you know, in our work, we see, we haven't even tried progesterone, but we see, you know, from the yeah. estrogen cycle and from yeah. our work, we yeah. just put in estradiol, that was yeah. enough. Yeah. There are other studies using different allergens and different models to trigger asthma and how they measure yeah. asthma, but they needed both. And yeah. that's the oh, study really? that I showed yeah. to you that had the both together right. because one wasn't enough. Right. And, to, yeah. To we still don't know much. The progesterone receptor in the lung is very lowly expressed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and as some people say that it's not expressed at all. I don't right. I'm not sure that. Right. So there's also right. controversy around that. So I think right. that causes for people to not get funded to do this type of work, right? right? Because your right. grant, if it's about progesterone, it only right. takes one reviewer to say, well, how do we know the progesterone? How do you know? You mean? Right. So right. that takes the research. Um, right, right, right. Yeah. Which makes sense. Um, um, the the transition i thought that the the other um before i get to the four core genotype the other thing that i thought found was really interesting was the um the transgender uh data showing that like i was i guess i would have predicted oh male to female especially if it's you know driven by estradiol and even estradiol and progesterone whichever camp you belong to um uh, that that would be higher which it was but it was still pretty high in the other transitioning. Yeah. Is there any data? Did he have any data on, you know, what the, I guess, whether or not it was newly induced asthma or is it just asthma symptoms? Do you, do you remember? I don't know. Yes, those were just electronic medical records or right. secondary analysis. And they That's just had, you know, it's, it's the ICD code. Right. Like ICD's code asthma yeah. ever diagnosed, right. Like right. no matter right. what type. So yeah, it was right. a very big, yeah, just no, that would be really interesting though to, to be able to follow up. But it sounded like you guys are going to be following yeah, up. Yeah, we're talking about it. We're having some discussions. We're both very busy. But uh ideally he he's a clinician, so he has access to the patients and the records. Yeah. And I want to do something similar with my mice because I've already yeah. done that. Yeah. With the right. male when I take to my street right. with a female right. hormone, I can do the opposite. So right. that's gonna be the grant. <laughs> Right, right. Good. I like it. I like it. I'm looking forward to that too. Um, yeah, so the four core genotype, um, so interesting to me um, because you often see, uh, you know, chromosomes are making the difference, but here you're really finding that it's the gonads that are making the difference. It's probably just because of their early, um, early stages of, uh, you know, people using the four, adopting the four core genotype mm -hmm. model. Um, uh, I thought I'm, I, I was, I was wondering 
whether, and then I was just trying to think, like I, then I was getting confused with the four core genotype because I was writing it down really fast. <laughs> question. But um, so everybody can just, you know, listen to my silly question, but I was kind of expecting that it's possible that on an XY background, a female gonad would be beneficial, would be more protective because of the data that you had and the males with Mm -hmm. um, so do you have any ideas about why that might be or no we are you know this is the first set of data we got very recently because as you know those animals were very hard to obtain and breed (laughs) and our protocol takes five to develop the phenotype so yeah it took us a while to like get enough and to start analyzing but yeah the trends seem to point to that so Yeah. yeah We haven't even thought about it. also I just show you like big picture right we yeah. got about 5,000 genes and then there's yeah. a lot of genes right. and we just put them on IPA and okay what comes up and right. it came up that more similar things were happening when you had the female than the male but obviously between those uh, xy or xx with the male or the uh, right. female yeah. we there were differences and yeah. obviously we just need to look deeper um, yeah. to establish what's going on there's probably going to be an interaction of both that's yeah. my prediction but that's right cool. now yeah first look yeah <laughs> no that was better. that was so yeah I did not tweet about that it was very but it was still really 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 interesting and so important to call up on um is there any questions from the audience we only have a couple minutes but we do have some just in case anyone please don't be shy no. some of you I met some of you at OSSB Oh, yeah. <laughs> OSSD is so great. And I forgot to mention at the very beginning that you were uh, a, a um, we are proud to have you at OSSD as a member. Oh, so. <laughs> I love it. Um, yeah, it's always, a, it's always, uh, always so great. You can meet so many different kinds of people. R- hey. Ramita, you have a <laughs> oh, I was just popping in to say hello. Hello. I also met Dr. Silveira and yeah, sure. ossd so I, I just want to say hello and wonderful presentation thank you yeah, Romina. good to see you again good to see you too she was in the round table or the mentoring table uh that's how you met each other yeah 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 bringing people together that's what ossd is all about <laughs> yeah well, fantastic well thank you well thank you for um coming off camera or coming onto camera Romina, and um Please, those of you that are still online, please join me in thanking uh, Dr. Patricia Sil... Vera. Vera, Vera, Vera. Almost, Vera. Just Vera. think of an A, Sil Vera. Vera. Yeah. Vera. Vera. <laughs> You'll get it. I'll, I'll keep, get it someday. You will keep practicing. <laughs> I'll keep practicing. <laughs> it's not easy. <laughs> no, it is easy. It's just my tongue doesn't seem to. Uh... Anyway, thank you very well, much. Thank you so much. It's good to see you. Good to see you too. All right. Take care. Bye. Lisa.